This lecture is about Hertzsprung Russell diagrams of stars, which we usually just call HR diagrams. They're named after the astronomers who created them. HR diagrams are graphs that show the surface temperature of stars in Kelvin on the x-axis and the luminosity of stars measured in proportions of the luminosity of the sun on the y-axis. Both axes are graphed logarithmically, which means that the numbers on the axis do not increase linearly, they increase by multiples of a number. So as an example, on the y-axis of this HR diagram, you can see that each additional notch is multiplied by 100 from the previous notch. And on the x-axis here, each additional notch is divided by 2. The reason we graph HR diagrams this way is that this specific format allows us to see clear patterns emerging in the properties of stars. And just for context, this is the luminosity of the sun. So each notch on the y-axis is 10 to a certain power times that luminosity. If I were to take a large amount of stars from space at random and fill out this chart using the properties of those stars, it would look something like this. There are a few different patterns that emerge on this graph, so I'm going to go through and talk about them. The first pattern you might notice is this long streak of stars going roughly linearly all the way down the graph. These are called main sequence stars. They're kind of the main type of star in the universe. They follow a consistent pattern where an increase in temperature also means an increase in luminosity. About 90% of stars in the universe are main sequence stars, and our sun is actually also a main sequence star. So our sun obviously has a luminosity of one sun, of one Earth sun, so that would be 10 to the power of zero for luminosity. And that dot is roughly at the temperature of our sun as well. So that's where our sun would appear on this diagram. About 90% of all stars in the universe are main sequence stars. That's kind of why they're called the main sequence. It's the sequence of increasing luminosity versus temperature that most stars follow. In this corner over here, I can see that these stars are very luminous. They have a high luminosity number, but they're not very hot. This must mean that they're very large. The same energy distributed across more mass leads to a lower temperature. This means that the stars in the top right of the graph must be very large. We call these stars giants. They're very large, they're very luminous, but they're also relatively cool. There's a special class of extremely luminous and extremely large stars that we call supergiants. So this would be the area of the HR diagram where they appear. Stars that are not too luminous but are extremely hot must have a low amount of energy but have that energy inside a very compact space to make the temperature high. So they're physically very small. We call these stars white dwarfs. They're very hot, they're not very luminous, and they're small stars. So in general, we say that stars on an HR diagram exist along a main sequence with three islands of red giants, supergiants, and white dwarfs. The color of a star is determined by its temperature. The hottest stars are blue, then white, then yellow, then red, and this is roughly where each color appears on the HR diagram. So any stars that have a temperature of roughly 10,000 to 5,000 Kelvin will appear as yellow. From about 13,000 to 10,000, they'll appear as white. And from 40,000 to 20,000, it's blue. And from less than 5,000, those stars appear as red. So if a dot falls within that color band, that star literally is that color in the sky. This picture on the right is a much more detailed, accurate, and color-coded HR diagram. And even with the extra detail, it's not too difficult to read and understand. So I can see that I have that main sequence of stars going up and to the left. I have a patch of white dwarfs on the bottom left. I have giants on the top right and super giants on the top. And you can see that the axis on the left measures luminosity in terms of multiples of the sun's luminosity. And on the x-axis listed on top, you can see temperatures listed. The top of the graph is also organized by spectral type. This is a way of classifying stars by color and temperature. Stars of the same spectral type always exist in the same range of temperature. You should be aware of this, but you do not need to memorize it for IB physics specifically. So I've listed the different spectral types. The names of the spectral types are really just names for ranges of temperature and the color that the stars appear as. The letters are O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and you can see each one corresponds to a different color of star and a different range of temperature. So if a star is spectral type B, its temperature must be between 10,000 and 30,000 Kelvin. If it's spectral type K, it must be between 3,700 and 5,200 Kelvin. And just as a note, students can sometimes get confused looking at this graph and assume that this is a kind of map of the physical location of stars in space. Like it looks like it could be 
maybe like a strangely shaped cloud of stars. But this graph says nothing about the position of stars and is only a way of organizing them by temperature and luminosity. So this says nothing about where stars physically are in space. Astronomers have an equation that predicts the luminosity of a star given its surface area, temperature, and a constant. I'm just going to have you read through this equation. It's pretty straightforward. There's one new constant that we haven't worked with before, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the negative 4th. Because all stars are spheres, we can rewrite that surface area as the surface area of a sphere to get the bottom equation that includes the radius of the star. And because this is a logarithmic graph, when we hold the radius of the star constant, stars with the same radius appear on a line on the graph. So as an example, any star that appears exactly on this line has a radius of about 1 100th of the radius of Earth's sun. Stars that appear on this line have a radius that's equal to Earth's sun, and stars that appear on this line have a radius that's 100 times larger than Earth's sun. And you could draw these lines for any radius that you want. As an example, between 1 and 100, you could find a line for 10 times the Earth's sun, but we don't want to fill this up completely with lines because we could draw an infinite amount. So I'll just draw a few as an example. So we call these lines of constant radius. Any two stars that appear along the same line of constant radius have the same radius as each other. So you can see that as you go up and to the right on the graph, the radius of the stars that you're looking at, therefore the size of the stars that you're looking at, increases. This equation, luminosity is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the area times the temperature to the fourth, can be used to describe proportional relationships between the luminosity, size, and temperature of different stars. I'll use this to answer a few questions about the sizes of different stars on this HR diagram. This first question says, comparing stars A and C, which star is larger? So I can see A is in the top left, C is in the top right. I can compare their luminosity and see that they have the same luminosity. They're on the same point on the graph. And I can compare their temperatures and see that star A has a greater temperature than star C. If I take that equation for luminosity on the top and rearrange it to find the surface area of a star, this is the equation that I get. So because star A and star C have the same luminosity, but star A has a greater temperature than star C, the denominator of star A's area will be greater than the denominator of star C's area. Their numerators are the same, but there's a number in the denominator of A that is bigger than the denominator of C. So if you have a bigger denominator, that means that as a whole your number is smaller, so that means that the surface area of C is greater than the surface area of star A, which means that star C is larger than star A. So to get that information, I used information from the diagram and the equation L equals the Boltzmann constant times area times, times temperature to the fourth. So based on that pattern, following a horizontal line from left to right on an HR diagram leads to larger stars. This fits our understanding because if we look back here, we can see that as we go from left to right, we do get larger and larger stars. The red giants are to the right of supergiants, but they're also lower on the graph. If you were to just follow a perfectly horizontal line from the supergiants, you would get larger and larger stars in that direction. So if you draw any horizontal line between two stars on this graph, and two stars are on the same horizontal level, the star on the right will always be bigger than the star on the left. This also fits our understanding based on those lines of constant radius. I can see that as I go from left to right, the radius is increasing. We can now try comparing stars A and B and see which star is bigger here. So star A and B, star A has the greater luminosity, and both stars have the same surface temperature. Plugging that into the equation for area, if the denominators are the same but the numerator of A is bigger than the numerator of B, that means that the surface area of A will be bigger than the surface area of B. So star A is the bigger star. Based on that pattern, we can see that following a vertical line from down to up on an HR diagram leads to larger stars. This fits our understanding. I can see that as we go up the diagram here, we go from smaller stars to larger stars. And that also fits the pattern on the lines of constant radius. As I go straight up, I can see that the radius of the stars I'm looking at gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We can now try comparing stars A and E and decide which star is bigger between the two of them here. So I can see that star A has a greater luminosity than star E, and the temperature of star A is also greater than star E. So for the area, 
the numerator of star a is greater than star e, but the denominator is also greater than star e. And so unless I have very specific numbers for both stars, I actually can't compare the areas of these two stars. This is not enough information on its own to be able to tell which star is bigger. So we'd need the exact numbers to know for sure which star is bigger than the other star. This also makes sense because if we think about going diagonally down the graph, I have no way of being sure exactly where that line of constant radius is unless I have specific numbers. So I don't know if by going diagonally down, I've gone below the radius where I was on before or above the radius where I was on before. Both of those lines point down. And so unless I have exact numbers, I can't just say that going diagonally and down means one thing or the other. So that's how to read HR diagrams and use the luminosity equation to predict which stars will be physically larger than other stars.